All right, well, it's a little bit past 205, so we're gonna get started with our second session. Um, hello and welcome everyone to our second presentation of our first session, Forest Carbon Works and Small Forest Landowner Experiences in the Carbon Market. My name is Ava Stone and I'm the Climate Smart Woods Supply Chain Manager here at Washington Conservation Action. Before we get started, we have a few logistical notes to cover. First, if you'd like to submit questions to the speakers, please use the Q&A feature, which you can access in your toolbar at the bottom of your webinar screen. We will be sorting through the questions and presenting them to the speakers at the end of the presentation. You can also use the chat box to send messages, but please keep in mind that any messages will be visible to all attendees. If you're just joining us, here's a reminder that this session will be recorded and shared with all participants after the conference. Okay, let's get started. The carbon market is a topic of significant discussion and opportunity in the forestry sector, including in Washington, where our Climate Commitment Act will generate new demand for carbon offset projects. Landowners of all sizes are able to earn revenue from sale of carbon offset credits, and in the process, implement forest management with climate benefits. To date, entry to the carbon market has been challenging for landowners with small land holdings. Various efforts are underway to reduce barriers to participation for smaller landowners. This presentation will feature a small forest landowner in Oregon, David Bugney, who will talk about his improved forest management, or IFM, carbon offset project. The Bugney family signed a 60-year contract with Forest Carbon Works in 2023 to develop and manage the IFM project. Forest Carbon Works, or FCW, started developing IFM projects in 2016, primarily in Oregon, with the mission to make long-term conservation possible and profitable for family forest owners. Forest Carbon Works, Northwest Regional Forester, Sandy Letzing, will explain how improved forest management projects are developed at FCW, from qualification to quantification and verification. Please join me in welcoming our next two speakers. Sandy Letzing has a master's degree in resource management from Oregon State University and has extensive experience working for and with tribal, state, and federal agencies to enact natural resource landscape scale projects. Her focus has been on forest health and wildfire resilience, as well as water quality initiatives in Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. She is the Pacific Northwest Forester for the Forest Carbon Works and is based in Carleton, Oregon. David Bugney is a retired structural engineer and small forest landowner. His family owns 101 acres in rural Estacado, Oregon. They were the 2020 Clackamas County Woodland Farmer of the Year and the 2022 State of Oregon Tree Farmer of the Year. David currently serves on the board of the Clackamas County Farm Forestry Association, is the board chair of the Clackamas River Basin Council, and a member of the Clackamas County Climate Action Task Force. David is also a member of the Oregon Department of Forestry's Adaptive Management Program Committee and Committee for Family Forest Lands. And with that, I'll pass it over to you two. Thank you. Okay, so hopefully everybody can see that fine. Um, good afternoon and thanks for having us. It's great to be here. And thank you to uh, Washington Conservation Action for hosting. Um, so I'm the Pacific Northwest Forester for Forest Carbon Works. So we work with private forest landowners uh, nationwide, uh, providing access to the carbon market. Uh, previous to this job, I was actually the stewardship forester for a conservation district in central Washington. Um, and that's actually how I heard about Forest Carbon Works, um, as it was the only company that could connect smaller landowners to the carbon market. Um, and I was and I'm, I'm still excited to connect landowners to this new tool for them to use to help fund forest health management, land stewardship, um, and most importantly, to keep forest as forest. So I'm gonna spend the next 15 or so minutes kind of giving an overview um, of our carbon program and the current market of Forest Carbon Works. Um, and then I'm going to introduce David Bugney. He's a um, member at FCW, who is a small forest landowner in Western Oregon. So he can talk about his experience entering into the carbon market um, and then what it means for him and his property. Okay, so why is forest carbon important? Uh, forests um, face many significant um, challenges to generate carbon credits, um, but also there's a huge potential within the United States. So you, the U.S. forest and wood products offset about 16% of all U.S. annual emissions each year. Um, about 60% of our forests in the United States are privately owned. About 40% uh, of those um, are family forests, and the remainder are corporately owned. 
43% uh, of private forest landowners are 65 years or older. So that makes them really susceptible to generational transfers, uh, fragmentation and development when those transfers happen. So that demographic of family forest owners really increases the significance of finding ways to make uh, long-term conservation of forests um, not only possible, but profitable to secure the legacies of these family forest owners to small families um, and in order to keep these forests as forests. Uh, so today our focus is on the West Coast and we all know that the Pacific Northwest has a really tremendous ability to grow trees um, and therefore also the potential to sequester carbon. Um, and a lot of it can be found in private forest land. So there's a, um, about 15% of the forested acres in Washington are private land, that's about 20 million acres. Um, in Oregon, that's 34% or about 10 million acres. Um, and Oregon had the highest amount of sequestered carbon of any U.S. state. So about 34 million metric tons of carbon were sequestered. Um, that actually accounts for 90% of total um, carbon emitted in the state in one year. So that was 90% that was re-sequestered back into our forest um, each year. So there was a ton of potential for these carbon projects. So when I talk about forest carbon offsets, there are three available carbon offsets um, available in the United States right now. Uh, the first one um, is improved forest management. Um, the second one, avoided conversion. And the third one is afforestation or reforestation. So today we're actually gonna be focusing on improved forest management. And that is the project type that we focus on at Forest Carbon Works. It's currently the most available carbon program for family owners, forest owners. So about 90% of total current forest carbon projects throughout the United States are IFM. So the idea of this project type is a commitment to a change in management to improve standing stocks of carbon over historical silver cultural management practices that are, are common to that region. So IFM carbon projects are the quantified accrual of carbon in a forest over time uh, it's measured in both carbon storage within the trees and then carbon sequestration. So the amount of carbon that they take out of the air. Um, and that kind of, that determines the amount of carbon offsets or credits that can then be transacted on the carbon market. So to illustrate this concept, um, this image kind of shows more in detail how an improved forest management project works over the duration of the project timeline. So the gray line on the bottom um, shows the baseline, um, and that is created from both regional forest management inventory data um, and then private um, management data that we collect um, throughout the region. So that's kind of the historical or average use of a forest in a region. So the, the green line on top shows the change in forest carbon stocking over time that is within a carbon offset project, an IFM project. So um, for this landowner, for example, um, it looks like they um, did a longer rotation, right? They might have skipped a harvest and then the rising and falling shows um, harvest over time that they perhaps have done um, after that extended rotation. It's just an example. But the idea is that this green line has to remain above that gray line, the baseline for the project to be viable. So the teal green in the middle shows the amount of additionality that the project creates, which then translates to the amount of carbon offset credits that can, that can then be transacted on the carbon market. So um, we know that there's a significant potential for these carbon offsets in the United States and globally, um, but of those that have been developed and issued so far, um, are they actually working to help us reach our emissions reduction goals? So this is a question that we get asked frequently at Forest Carbon Works, and I think a lot of you are probably already thinking it. Um, and many people consider it before they enroll in a carbon project. So um, in a Trove research study that just came out at the start of this month, um, they found that um, they looked at 4,000 companies and they surveyed them on emissions reductions between 2017 and 2022. Um, they found that emissions reductions were twice as much with companies using carbon credits purchased on the voluntary market than those that did not use credits. Um, additionally, those companies that purchased higher in integrity credits and higher price credits uh, reduced emissions more than those that purchased lower value credits. So the California Compliance Market or the cap and trade program um, actually reached their emissions reduction targets four years ahead of schedule with assistance of their offset program as well. So these are examples that are not meant to demonstrate that carbon credits are the only solution to our emissions reduction goals, but it is an important part of that solution. 
So I just now want to introduce you a bit to how we fit into this market and give you an overview of our program and process for small private landowners that are interested in entering into the market um, and also what it means for them in terms of managing their forests. So um, at FCW, um, our IFM program currently has about 60 members across 40,000 acres and growing. The green dots on this map show projects that um, are currently already developed and their members, and then the yellow ones um, denote projects that are under development. We actually have a lot of projects in Appalachia, um, probably due to the fact that their timber market's not as strong over there. Um, we do have, and our oldest projects are in Oregon and Washington. The oldest one in Oregon is about six years old. So we do have a few projects in Oregon that we developed in the compliance market in California. But a few years ago, we switched to the voluntary market um, simply because it was taking uh, too long to develop the programs within uh, the projects within the compliance market. On average, it was taking three to four years. Just the bureaucracy was too much. So we took our program and just shifted all the metrics and how we develop projects over into the voluntary market. And that's where we develop most of our projects now. So just a quick overview for our IFM program, um, our minimum acreage to participate is 40 forested acres, and we have no maximum. Um, our program is available throughout the continental U.S. and parts of Southeast Alaska. Um, the contract length is 60 years, and that is broken down into two parts. There's a 25-year payment period. That's where we pay the lander per acre per year for the sequestration, sequestration and storage of carbon in their forests. And that is followed by a 35 year monitoring period. So during that 25 year payment period, our uh, members receive annual payments. And then during the 35 year monitoring period, there are no annual payments. Uh, but during that monitoring period, there's real, relatively little oversight on the forest management. And the goal really is to keep forest as forest during this time. So you can't subdivide it or, or develop it into a Walmart. Um, our average payments start at $10 an acre per year, and that is the national average. Um, so however, we do know that in the Northwest, we have higher growth rates and biomass. So that translates to more carbon being stored quicker. So I would say on average, we are double that, um, that national average west of the Cascades. And that is reflected in the payments as well. Um, we have the option for a revenue share option. So, um, and the landowner can choose to enroll in that or receive a flat payment per acre per year rate. Um, being in revenue share really allows you just to capitalize on the current market price of carbon as it, it has continued to increase year after year. Um, we have harvest flexibility um, and with that, a free forest certification through FSC. And I'll talk about that more in depth in a minute. Um, and there's no cost for the landowner to enroll or throughout the entire contracting period, so all 60 years. Um, all the costs to develop, certify, and maintain the project are deducted and rolled into that final per acre per year price that we're able to offer the landowner. Um, so again, for our enrollment, our minimum acreage is 40 forested acres. It must be located. Um, it can be located anywhere within the United States, but it doesn't have to be necessarily within the same parcel. You can have several parcels spread out. You have to own your own timber rights or the rights to commercially harvest, right? That's part of that additionality, right? If it's already been protected or restricted, then we can't show that we're doing any additional work to protect it. Um, you can't have any um, overly restrictive conservation easements on your property that limit harvesting. Um, again, that will impact the additionality of the project. Um, and we do require you to enroll all your eligible forest ownership. So all your ownership over under one landowner. Um, that's a requirement of our methodology and it avoids something we call activity sh shifting leakage. So that's when a harvest activity increases on a portion of your project as a result of decreasing harvest from the carbon project on the other portion of your property. Um, our, our team does need to uh, periodic access to your property to complete forest inventories and a harvest inspection if you do plan to harvest. Um, so usually we repeat that inventory every five years. So again, during that payment period, you receive an annual payment of whatever that offer is. Our nation average is 10, of course, more um, probably here in the Northwest, um, or payments that are equated to 25% of that revenue share from the credit sales from your property. You can actually extend the payment period from 25 years all the way up to 50 years in five year increments. So if the program is working for you, you can increase that. Uh, but at the end of the payment period, there's always going to be a monitoring period. 
You can also extend that monitoring period for up to 100 years. So the total contract length can be up to 150 years um, or it can be as short as 60 years. Kind of depends on the goals of the landowner. Um, often with longer contracts, what we can do is turn around and sell those credits for a little bit more because you are promising to lock up that carbon for a greater period of time. Um, but it kind of all depends on the goals again of the landowner. Um, so for any commercial harvest in which trees are removed from the property, um, FSD certification is required and that's part of our methodology. Um, but that, so we are actually um, certificate holders through FSD. So it's free to our members. So we manage all the certification requirements, uh, management plan writing, adaptations, reporting and audits that have to do with FSD. Um, and you don't have to sell your logs um, to an FSD mill. It just, the harvest just has to be FSD certified. Um, so when we do the initial assessment on the property, we take 10% of the total volume of um, carbon or it's basically equated to basal area from your property and we set it aside and, and we reserve that and never try to sell those credits. And the idea is that um, we set that aside for the landowner to use for any type of uh, forestry practices that they need to complete without worrying um, about affecting their crediting. Um, and so um, we also have a harvest offset fee to allow for harvest needs beyond this 10%. So we just have to model that out and it's kind of based on the landowner. If you seed say up to 20% of volume at a time for a harvest, we'd have to model out and see what it would look like in terms of either um, reducing your um, payment for the year or it might pause it depending on how much carbon is removed or volume is removed from the property. But again, that's something that can be calculated and modeled out as part of the decision-making process. Um, David, can attest to that and maybe he'll talk about his planned um, commercial harvest he has um, while in our program. We do have an annual survey that needs to be completed online as a part of our um, reporting requirements. Um, so things like firewood removals, observed changes to forest health conditions, um, and then we do have um, foresters available on staff throughout each region of the United States like myself and that's just to provide you know, additional forestry assistance to the landowner and make site visits if there's concerns on the property. So that 35 year monitoring period is uh, immediately after the payment period. Again, you can choose to extend that payment period and extend that monitoring period. Um, that's up to the landowner. Um, so it can be as short as 35 years, or you can extend it up to hundred years. But the idea is some people treat it as a an easement on their property, essentially. Um, it also increases the chances that you will be able to, will be able to market those credits for a higher value. And then we'll be able to turn around and pay that um, increased value to the landowner. So again, the responsibilities are much less during this monitoring period. Um, you do have to maintain for stocking throughout this time. That's equivalent to the amount you're credited for. Um, during the payment period. And that's something we can provide you details of when the transition from the payment period into the monitoring period is completed. Um, FSD certification is not required for the harvest and there's no harvest offset fee during this time and no annual survey requirements. Okay, so um, in order to um, become a member, uh, we try to make it really easy. Um, we know, and I've heard from that previous landowner that it was really difficult for them to enter into the carbon market. So we do try to make the process simple. Um, so to enroll, you fill out an application online, you go to our website, you complete an online application. It's basically your name, your address, your parcel information. Um, then you'll be connected with one of our regional sales team members. Um, we'll review that application, map it, analyze the property, um, and in the Northwest, we will probably do an abbreviated cruise to confirm the carbon estimates. Uh, then we can then present you with a membership offer, and if you're interested, you can sign up and enroll. If you do sign up, um, it's about 30 days from when you enroll to when you receive that first payment. Um, so after you enroll, we do complete an on-site carbon inventory to verify your carbon stocks. Um, and we take the project from start to credit sales. And um, after that, you really just have to complete the annual survey um, in order to re remain in the project. Okay. So who are our members? Well, our members really fall into three main categories. Um, forest owners that are family legacy oriented, um, conservation minded or financially focused. 
Um, of those that are more financially focused, they're really looking to diversify the revenue streams for a more steady income. Uh, many are considering how carbon payments will help secure their land for their, for their heirs. Um, we work a lot with family trusts and they often put payments into trusts to pay for things like taxes or forest maintenance for their children. Um, it's pretty hard for us to compete financially with an industrial style management, especially on the west side. Um, but we do provide an alternative alternative to folks who aren't looking to manage their forest so intensively um, and may place value on things such as fish or habitat, recreation, water, or um, other things that you receive from a healthy forest. So um, with that in mind, I wanted to introduce you to David Bugney. He's been an FCW member for six months or so. His family forest is just east of Portland, Oregon. And I wanted him to tell you about his experience, a bit about his forest and management style and why he felt carbon offsets was a good fit for him and his family. Thank you, Sandy. So just a brief introduction to our uh, family forest land. Uh, we own 101 acres of which uh, 99 are in forest land and we have that's uh, distributed over five timber parcels we acquired our first which was our home site in 1991 you can see how we've added to it uh, our carbon stocks have been estimated at about 213 metric tons of co2 equivalent per acre and a sequestration rate of about five and a half tons of co2 equivalent per acre per year on our properties when you sum them all together uh, in addition to what uh, was mentioned in the beginning, uh, we were this year's regional semifinalists for Outstanding Tree Farmer of the Year for the Western United States and also 2019 recipient of the Fish and Wildlife Stewardship Award for Forest Lands from uh, our Oregon Department of Forestry and Department of Fish and Wildlife. And lastly, uh, a partnership award with the U.S. Forest Service for uh, um, uh, stewardship and outreach and aquatic restoration. So we, we try to do a fairly balanced uh, approach to our uh, natural resource use, uh, primarily focused on uh, on fish habitat restoration and wildlife uh, habitat enhancement. And so, our even before the the hubbub about uh, carbon storage and sequestration really came to the fore here in the past, say five or ten years, we've been managing our family's forest land for many years with enhanced carbon storage and sequestration in mind, uh, including. Uh, we've always managed our forests for mature forest conditions. We don't burn our slash. We uh, usually uh, cut it up and, and, and lop it up and distribute it across the forest floor to return the carbon to the soil. And we also incorporate uh, red alder into our species mix. So it's not a, a, a monoculture of just dug fir. We have quite a variety of species, but the red alder in particular being a the natural nitrogen fixer will also enhance, uh, of course, to some degree, the uh, the uh, growth rate of our uh, conifers and other trees on our property. So uh, next slide. Give you an idea of our property layout. Uh, we're located uh, in a rural area between Estacada and Sandy in Northwest Oregon. So we're approximately 40 miles east of Portland. It's a very rural area. The closest town's about uh, 10 minutes, uh, 15 minutes away by car. Uh, you can see how our parcels are distributed here. We have three contiguous on the right side and then two more contiguous on the left side separated by, oh, about less than a quarter of a mile. And so we've been purchasing properties that have this uh, salmon bearing stream running through them. And so they all have the creek, uh, or, which is called Suter Creek running through it. And our stands range in age from seedlings to about 100 years with an average stand age of approximately 50 years. Next slide, please. Oops, For some reason I went backwards. There we go. Be on the one that so, shows the Okay. Uh, why do we own forest? Yeah, we're good. So why do we own forest land? Probably, uh, you know, there's hard to really provide a hierarchy here, but I think of all the things that that we value. Uh, we have two uh, children; they're full grown now, and and uh, uh, so we recreate on the property quite frequently. And uh, I think we we value nature and wildlife, including, as I mentioned, about one mile of the salmon bearing stream. So in Oregon, 
It's classified as a medium to large salmon steelhead bull trout stream, even though there are no bull trout, that's the classification is. It is in, but it is a very active uh, uh, coho salmon and winter steelhead uh, runs. Uh, we love the beauty of our place and the privacy uh, being fairly remote. Our closest neighbor, as far as a home, is about a quarter mile away. Uh, recreation, as I mentioned, we're always out there doing something. Uh, and then as timber production, uh, uh, we, as I mentioned, uh, we have had thinning done in 2014, which is a commercial thinning. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. Uh, we also have a uh, planned uh, next thinning, a much larger thinning in about 2030, when that stand is available to thin. And uh, we also look at it as a uh, investment, not only in in the value of the of the saw logs on the property, but in the value of the property itself. And uh, uh, we're we're all amateur photographers, so that picture in the uh, lower left is of a uh, uh, northern pygmy owl that had just fledged. So it's pretty cute. Uh, next slide, please. So how we steward our forest land, aside from the uh, commercial thinning activities, which we do not do ourselves, we don't have the uh, equipment for that. Uh, we do, however, all of our pre-commercial thinning, on, which is shown on the left side of the screen. Uh, we do all of our planting of trees uh, in the middle, and uh, as well as uh, all pruning activities, fuels reduction activities uh, as shown on the right side there. And we've been doing these activities since we purchased the property. So for over 30 years, we've been doing this type of work and we continue to, to do it. Uh, we always uh, uh, try to plant, uh, you know, interplant where, where needed with uh, shade tolerant trees, for example, uh, Western hemlock or Western red cedar, uh, and also in areas that uh, we're converting from, uh, 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 say, uh, uh, an all reducing uh, alder, for example, into a more conifer heavy stand like you see here in the middle photo. Uh, next slide, please. We also do other things on the property. Uh, uh, last year, uh, we started to do a, a wetland restoration as an experiment. It was an area in our area of Oregon. Uh, we have an invasive species that's uh, quite invasive to say the least it's called reed canary grass and so uh and we are we try to minimize use of herbicides as much as we can and particularly in a wetland area we don't use any herbicides whatsoever so in this case what we did was we did a multi-month mechanical removal of the reed canary grass uh, by uh, brush cutting pulling removal of thatch etc and it turned out to be a great success so we replanted it with native uh uh, sedges and, and grasses and rushes and uh, other wildflowers that belong in the wetland that we've seen elsewhere on the property. And I would say that for our first uh, endeavor into, or foray into this uh, type of restoration worked really well. The other thing we've been doing is um, on the right side of the screen, we have a meadow restoration. It was actually an abandoned uh, livestock pasture that had gone fallow and it was basically overrun by blackberries and whatnot. And so we've spent uh, the past year converting that uh, from that. To, and we just planted uh, native grasses and wildflowers in that about a month ago. And they're they're already germinating. And, and I think it's going to be a great success. Uh, one thing we're trying to do is increase the uh, the uh, population of the olive-sided flycatcher in our area, which is a, uh, a species of concern in Oregon. And this uh, meadow, uh, in combination with the close by riparian area and the abundance of dug fir snags, this should hopefully uh, do that. Next slide, please. And uh, lastly, we uh, we also uh, participate uh, the bulk of our work in fish habitat restoration. I've written over one million dollars in grants for our property as well as neighbors in the community to enhance fish passage on. Suda Creek, uh, as well as a, a, the creek that it flows into. And you can see here in the bottom picture, we do a lot of uh, spawning gravel enhancements. Uh, the, uh, the, much of the creek uh, was scoured down to bedrock due to the lack of large wood and, and removal of large wood over the years. 
Uh, and you can see we've added uh, we've added on our own property alone about 24 engineered log jams uh, like what you see here on the right side, uh, which have worked tremendously to retain gravels and provide uh, complexity to the stream. And it's worked. I mean, we've 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 conducted our own studies in concert with the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife to show that our uh, Coho and steelhead populations have increased uh, or rebounded dramatically uh, since we started doing this kind of work, as you can see in the picture at the left. The next slide. Uh, we also, as I mentioned, we do commercial thinning. as the one we did in 2014 that yielded about 238,000 board feet of uh, saw logs and 258 tons of pulpwood. Uh, we use a skyline yarding system to yard over the creek. Uh, to, and also to minimize ground disturbance. And in 2030, we anticipate another harvest on an adjacent parcel of anywhere from three to 400,000 board feet. And as I mentioned, all commercial thinning activities, we will hire a contractor to do. Next slide. That's it. So with that, we open it up to questions for Sandy and myself. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, David and Sandy. Uh, we really appreciate hearing from you both. We have about 15 minutes or so for questions, so we'll feed them to you and um, try to get through as many as we can. So the first question from the audience, this is from Ed Steichel, um, are annual payments taxable as income? And this could probably be addressed to either one of you. Yep, they are normal income, so it's, it's taxed as such. Okay, great. Um, this is another question for you, Sandy. Um, can the 40 acre minimum be met across multiple landowners, assuming all of the other requirements are also met by all individuals or parcels involved? And would the parcels need to be continuous? This is from Brett Anderson. Um, yeah, right now we don't congregate or aggregate multiple landowners. It's just with the length of our contract, it ends up being really too complicated. So we're not there yet, maybe maybe in the future. Um, but if it is one landowner, it, it doesn't have to be continuous parcels. They could be spread across you know, a large geographic area, but it has to be one landowner. Okay, great. Um, and for David, this one's for you. Um, this comes from Savannah Reed. Do you find lop and scatter to be superior to mastication as a fuel reduction treatment for soil health? That's a good question. And uh, we've utilized both. And uh, it really depends, I think, on the uh, what it is that you're trying to thin out. Uh, so for example, when we're pruning, we all the limbs and whatnot, of course, we, we lop and scatter. But if you're gonna be uh, wanting to thin, pre-commercially thin, uh, for example, a stand of, uh, a young stand of Douglas fir, uh, that, that you, you know, probably the most economical method would be masticating, you know, where you take the trees and you, you hire a contractor or rent to the machine to do it yourself. And they basically create large shards of, of wood that can then uh, you know, decompose much more rapidly than the logs itself. But then on the flip side, in my view, it's also important to leave down, course down wood. So you need that wood uh, to more slowly decompose, not only just to, re, to more slowly, uh, you know, not allow the carbon to come back in the atmosphere too, too quickly, but also provide necessary wildlife habitat for mammals and amphibians and birds and all that. So I'd say it's, there's really no one clear cut solution. I think you look at the, uh, the spectrum of what's out there. And so probably the most common are pruning and masticating. There's, you know, biochar is becoming more uh, common, but it's uh, to what I've seen in cost studies, it's a little bit more expensive than masticating. But anyway, they're still worth all figuring out and try to and maybe work with your consulting forester or your local uh, uh, extension agent or soil and water conservation district to help you decide what is the best approach for you. Great. We have another question for you, David, regarding management practices. This one comes from Sydney. Um, is commercial thinning your chosen harvest method as opposed to clear cutting? Another good question. Uh, you know, again, this is the philosophy of the landowner. Uh, we just uh, bought forest land for the beauty of the forest land. And, uh, you know, I, I don't find much beauty in looking at 40 acres of stumps. And so as a result, uh, you know, everything we do is, is thinning based. And if you do it, if you think about it and plan it out well, you can uh, create a forest that, uh, well, Sandy can probably attest because she's been to our place several times, that uh, it's hard to tell that we did anything. You know, and and it it adds to the 
you know, we open up the canopy some to let more light in. So it allows the understory to grow, allows the remaining trees to grow with less stress due to their neighbors being gone, you know, the, the adjacent trees. And so, um, but in some cases, you know, on the, on the other side of the coin, when we did that thinning, we had a small, I, I guess for lack of a better term, I'd call it a clear cut of about maybe three acres just because what was there was just a lot of just shrubs, brush and things like that. And so there, there were very few uh, mercantable trees. And so what, that, what we did there was basically convert it from, from that over to a, a more a robust uh, conifer and uh, deciduous tree uh, area. Okay, the next question is for you, Sandy. It comes from Cindy Jane. Um, what kind of outreach are you doing to small landowners in Washington? Well, you're looking at, no, just kidding, actually, this isn't a small landowner event. Um, I work a lot with extension agents, so I do a lot of, I've been to like field days up in um, Washington, or I'll participate in their um, forest school programs, uh, and then a lot with the conservation district, so I'll work with their technical providers to educate them first, and then have them invite me along to uh, field days and educational events out there, and then any type of um, articles I can write, like at the extension um, newsletters or podcasts and stuff, I'll, I'll try to participate in. So if you have any ideas, let me know, please. Great, thanks. Um, this question again, I think is for you, Sandy. Um, which voluntary protocol do you use? This comes from Paula Sweden. Oh yeah, um, so we use the Vera version, like it's 0003 methodology. It's one of the earlier ones that we adopted um, and you can find it online. It's publicly available or if you're interested, I can email it to you. Great. And um, back to David, how has working with Forest Carbon Works and implementing a forest carbon offset project changed your practices or approach as a land manager? I think uh, that's a good question. I'd say that it really hasn't changed it hardly at all, because as I mentioned at the outset of my part of the presentation, we've been managing for uh, this in, in concept anyway, for almost 30 years, you know, so we've been moving toward more mature uh, forest conditions and, and that allows or that fits in the vein with the philosophy of of, of what we're of forest carbon works and uh, you know we uh, uh, aren't aren't into in the business of maximizing profit like an industrial forest landowner is where perhaps things like clear cutting and whatnot uh, on a more business as usual basis like Sandy's little sawtooth graph showed. Uh, we don't need to do that. We don't, as I think the previous speaker mentioned, we, we're not beholden to any shareholders other than our kids. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that allows us the flexibility of of entering into these kind of agreements. And so given that, uh, you know, we, we haven't really adjusted anything. And when, when uh, we worked together with Forest Carbon Works, you know, we told them up front, you know, we're going to be looking at a, a, at a thinning a substantial thinning in about 2030 of the amount uh, that we're anticipating. And that's probably the last time that we'll be doing anything, at least in my lifetime, as far as I can see. And, and we, our management plan extends out to 2050. So I'll be, you know, 90. So, uh, so anyway, uh, you know, given all that, uh, I, I have, I've seen very minimal change in, in the philosophy that we, re we originally adopted. Great. Thanks. Um, Sandy, this question is back to you and relates to the uh, Washington carbon market. So um, would Washington state landowners have the ability to generate credits under the Washington state forest carbon protocol? Our understanding is, is no, um, because they're in the voluntary protocol, um, but curious to hear your thoughts on this and how you expect the Washington carb carbon market will imp impact um, your organization in the future. Well, so we are just um, looking into um, that Cap, new cap and trade market. I assume that's what the question is about. Um, and so you could participate as a Washington landowner, um, but it probably won't be through us. We're still looking at what their protocols and stuff. It looks like it's very similar to the California compliance market. And so those are 125 year contracts. And part of the reason why we didn't participate is really just take the length of time it takes to develop a project. And it makes it really hard to work with small forest landowners. So we're looking at three to four years to develop a project. Um, and ultimately as a business and, and for the landowner, it was just too, too great of a length of time and investment before you saw a turnaround. And so that's why we are in the, in the voluntary market. And so, um, I don't know, you could probably work through, there's a couple of contractors I know who probably would work, but they're looking at larger, um, acreage at this time. 
And that's part of the deal with the cap and trade market in Washington is they're looking for direct envi environmental benefits. And so the project has to be located within the state of Washington or affect it directly for you to work through the cap and trade market in Washington. Hopefully that is. Okay. Yeah, great. Thanks for the clarification. Um, our next question comes from Savannah Reed. Um, how do U.S. Forest Service prescribed fuel reduction treatments fit into your expectations from small forest owners who wish to sell carbon credits? Um, that's a great question. As a West Coast forester, a lot of work I do is making sure that people's forests um, are compatible with our program, but also aren't going to burn down in the next major wildfire. And that's a, a huge part of the work I did in Eastern Washington. So I'm more familiar with state um, cost share projects um, and their requirements. But in general, if you are working in a dry forest, you side of the Cascades, um, and you're removing a lot of, let's say, really small fur in the, in the, in the understory, um, so most prescriptions are for removing, you know, 12 inch and under trees and the understory and then pruning up to 14 feet or something like that. If you think about a really large, large 24 inch ponderosa pine and then all those small trees, they ha they hold nothing to the amount of carbon being sequestered and stored in that ponderosa pine. So there really is minimal impact to the car overall carbon uh, project in terms of storage and sequestration when you're doing those types of prescriptions. So 12 inches and, and under in general. Um, within our methodology, we're actually not even allowed to measure trees five, inch, five inches and under. So that's kind of a freebie if you go through and you uh, masticate trees that are on average five inches or less. We're, that's something we're not even counting. So it wouldn't impact the project. Um, and generally, it relates to better carbon sequestration and storage in the future and reduced risk to wildfire. So it's something that we encourage. Um, so that 10% buffer pool is congregated among all projects. And so every year we look at how much we have left um, and we all allocate that to other landowners, usually out West that are trying to do fuels reduction that might exceed that 10%. So it's something that we can flex a little bit and we try to work with landowners to make sure that project, that type of work does happen. So it is compatible and we do often projects with landowners who are doing, you know, cost share fuels reduction treatments. Great, thank you. We have another question kind of related to um, fire and management. Um, is the 10% set aside usually enough to do fuel management for fire control? You, you kind of touched on this, but maybe just a little more expansion. Yeah, yeah, again, so it, I guess it depends on the landowner, right, and the type of management they've practiced before. Sometimes it's fine and sometimes it's not. And so if it really is really unmanaged forest and it looks like it, they're gonna have to take out a bunch of trees that are larger and really overcrowded. Sometimes I say, look, you probably are gonna have to do that before you enter into a carbon um, project. It's hard for us within the first five years of entering into a carbon project to see a big dip, uh, dip in that reduction and, and cross below that baseline. And so if it's a really unmanaged forest, sometimes I'll take a look and say, do the project before. But oftentimes if it's generally well managed and they're doing it again, those types of 10 inch, 12 inch and under fuels management treatments for the long term, it won't impact. It won't exceed that 10% or it's something that we can work with the landowner uh, with to make sure it doesn't impact crediting. Great, thanks. Um, this question is for both of you, but maybe we'll start with David first. Um, improved forest management projects provide numerous social and environmental benefits beyond carbon se sequestration. Are any of these benefits incorporated into the carbon credits you develop? And if so, how do you go about quantifying or reporting these co-benefits? That's probably a Sandy question because I don't know <laughs> the answer to that one. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, they're a huge part of, uh, of the program. I mean, so technically, no, we know we're not developing, we're not quantifying that and, and turning around, we're not able to sell that, we're quantifying the carbon. That said, often when we turn around and we're selling these projects to buyers, um, we'll, we'll highlight projects that are doing projects like David Bugney that might be doing restoration on salmon or um, are looking to conserve an area of really high environmental um, habitat benefit for a certain endangered species. We'll say like, we'll highlight that and hopefully we can sell the credits for more and then we can turn around again and pay that landowner more. And so that's what we try to highlight. Although technically what we're selling is strictly carbon right now. There's no protocol for other stuff that is great for the forest, but good question. Okay, we are slowly running out of time here. Um, we have a couple more questions that have rolled in. Um, last one here, Sandy, have you worked with NNRG in Washington to help educate more landowners about your program? Yes, um, 
I actually know Kirk really well. I cruised his property and we um, mocked up a development of a carbon project on his property so he could see how it's done. But the idea of hopefully he understands the process and knows how to educate his landers because they're a perfect fit for our program. Whether or not he enrolls, he's still thinking about it, but um, we did educate him and his um, other folks that he works with to make sure they understand that our program's available for their landowners that they work with. It's a great question. Okay, great. Well, I think that is our time. Um, we really appreciate having you both here, hearing more about your model um, with FCW, Sandy, as well as um, your experience on the ground managing your forest, David. So thank you both. Um, and just a reminder to everyone else on the call, you will not need to log out this time. Um, you can just stay on this link on this webinar and we will be back in about 10 minutes. So please take a quick break um, and be back for our next session. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you.